Greetings and welcome back. I hope that all of you are being safe out there. I'm hoping that you're doing the social distancing, that you're washing your hands a lot, uh, and that you're not putting yourself uh, in harm's way. I know I just looked at the statistics today in terms of this coronavirus and to see that now over 4,000 Americans and over 42,000 people around the world have died of this. Uh, it's pretty scary stuff, and I think that probably the worst uh, is yet to come. So please, please, please uh, be careful out there, and hopefully uh, you are self-quarantining and, and, and staying at home and not taking any unnecessary risks. So today I want to uh, move away from discrimination uh, targeting uh, uh, non-whites, blacks, uh, black Americans, and today I want to move into the arena of gender discrimination. I've told you many, many times that I believe that sexism is a worse problem uh, than racism. Uh, the older that uh, I get, uh, the more I realize that this is true, at least in my mind. And, and I think there are several reasons for this, but one of them is that I think women uh, face discrimination from both men as well as other women. Uh, for example, uh, political candidates. I believe that we hold female candidates to fi far higher standards of conduct than we do uh, male candidates. Uh, I'm going to focus most of my attention, obviously, on the discrimination that women have faced from men. I'm going to call that traditional male sexism. Uh, but I do uh, want you to realize that one of the reasons why I think that discrimination based on gender is worse is that that, that women are also, uh, in many cases, uh, harsh to other women. For example, there, were, there was a national survey a few years ago, uh, and in this survey, uh, women strongly preferred a male supervisor. Uh, interestingly, both men and women both preferred a male supervisor. But what bothered me about the article, and I'm blanking on, on where this survey was from, I believe it was a New York Times uh, survey. Uh, I think somebody else actually did it and the New York Times ran it. Uh, but was the commentary uh, by the women in the survey. Uh, uh, they used uh, very flattering terms when talking about their male supervisor, saying they were organized, they were team builders. Uh, they used a whole variety uh, of positive attributes. Uh, but when these women were referring to their female supervisor, they were very harsh. They used terms like petty, vindictive, never forgets a thing. Uh, and, of course, the B word was used uh, in this survey, that uh, their, their female boss was, a, quote, a bitch. Um, now, just personally, uh, I, I think that uh, uh, maybe the best supervisor that, uh, that I ever had was when I was uh, directing the Fulbright program at UC Davis many years ago. Uh, I had a female supervisor, Beth Greenwood. So um, my, uh, my experience with female bosses and supervisors is very, very, uh, very positive. And in my mind, uh, I don't care if my supervisor's male or female. Uh, I want them to be organized. I want them to be flexible and pragmatic and, and, and be results-oriented. And if so, we're going to get along just fine. Uh, in your handout, uh, if you're following along in your notes, uh, the Harvard Law Review did a very intriguing uh, study on sentencing patterns based on the gender of the judge. Uh, and what the Harvard Law Review came to the conclusion was that uh, for male defendants, it really didn't matter. There was no discernible difference between the sentencing patterns of male and female judges when it came to male criminal defendants. What was interesting, though, was their conclusion that female judges are far harsher to female defendants in sentencing uh, than male judges are. And I guess you could look at at sexism uh, either way here. Uh, one, you could look at it as, well, are the female judges simply holding women to higher standards of conduct uh, than men? Maybe. 
Uh, the other way you could look at it is that this is sexism from the male judges, that in this particular case, the men are being paternalistic. Uh, they're trying to uh, shield uh, uh, women who they see as more fragile. Uh, so I think you could look at those results and come to the conclusion that perhaps uh, there is some sexism on both parts. Who knows? Uh, if you scroll down to traditional male sexism, uh, this idea has been around for a long time, and I like to use uh, this quote. Thomas Jefferson was asked, what would the place for women be in our nation if our country were to become a pure or purer democracy? And Jefferson's response was, quote, were our country to become a pure democracy, we would still exclude women who to prevent deprivation of morals and ambiguity of ideas should not mix in gatherings of men. Their morality would be easily corrupted by politics and their muddle-headedness would confuse the issues. In other words, according to Thomas Jefferson, if you mix politics and women, uh, you're left with confusion. One of uh, my favorites in terms of just being unbelievably sexist was the Encyclopedia Britannica, and I don't have this one listed, but I, it just came to mind, so I thought that I would give it to you. The Encyclopedia Britannica of 1800 said, quote, women have smaller brains than men. Education would fatigue them and possibly ruin their reproductive organs, right? I guess the thinking is blood flow will go the wrong way. We could go extinct like the dinosaurs, but certainly uh, there's all kinds uh, of sexism implicit uh, in that statement by the encyclopedia. And that's kind of the scary thing, isn't it? Uh, you would think the encyclopedia is where you would go for knowledge, and yet uh, what you have is a, a tremendous amount uh, of sexism. Uh, the most famous case involving gender discrimination in the 19th century was a case called Bradwell versus Illinois in 1873. And certainly put some stars uh, uh, next to this case. Myra Bradwell made a very straightforward uh, suit in this case. Uh, Myra Bradwell claimed that the, the Illinois state law prohibiting women from becoming attorneys from practicing law was a violation uh, of the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution. And it appears to be a no-brainer. It appears to me that the Illinois law is clearly unconstitutional. Uh, and yet, if you look at this case, the Supreme Court overwhelmingly, by an eight to one margin, upheld an Illinois law prohibiting women from becoming an attorney. And let's see if I can, can paraphrase. I probably should have written this down. But uh, here is a very close paraphrase. Uh, to what was said in this case by the majority. Quote, man is or should be woman's protector and defender. The natural and proper timidity and delicacy which belongs to the female sex evidently unfits it for many of the occupations of civil life. The harmony of interests which belong or should belong to the family institution is repugnant to the idea of a woman adopting a distinct and independent career from that of her husband. The paramount mission and destiny of women are to fulfill the noble and benign offices of wife and mother. This is the law of the Creator. You almost expect the Supreme Court to say, P.S., God doesn't want you to practice law. So you're thinking, okay, Randall, it's 1873. In 1873, the Supreme Court was doing all kinds of reprehensible things. We talked about uh, cases like the civil rights cases of 1883, Plessy versus Ferguson, in which racial, racial discrimination uh, was tolerated and allowed, including the infamous separate but equal doctrine. So it, it perhaps it is no surprise that gender discrimination would also be allowed by the Supreme Court of that era. But here's what's different about gender discrimination. 
When we talked about racial discrimination, I told you that the Supreme Court very gradually started striking down laws that discriminated against people by race uh, in the 19-teens and 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s. The difference in the case of gender discrimination is that we do not see a Supreme Court case striking down discrimination targeting women until 1971. In other words, it took a century after Bradwell versus Illinois for the Supreme Court to strike down laws discriminating against women. And here, uh, I want to mention Earl Warren again. I've told you that Earl Warren I consider to be maybe the second greatest chief justice in American history, but remember I told you this man has blind spots. When it came to pornography and obscenity, this notion of normal versus deviant sex, uh, in the arena of civil rights, he also has a blind spot. For Earl Warren, if you were being discriminated against because of your race, Warren was there in several cases, and I mentioned several of them in earlier presentations, in Brown versus the Board of Education, in the Atlanta Heart of Motel versus U.S., in Katzenbach versus McClung. But Earl Warren, in his 16 years on the Supreme Court, did not strike down a single law discriminating against women. So while the Supreme Court was there in case after case after case in the 50s and 60s, protecting people from racial discrimination, women did not get any legal remedy, did not get any legal help from the Supreme Court until the landmark case of Reed versus Reed, which I'll talk about later, uh, in 1971. Actually, I, uh, why don't I mention it here? In Reed versus Reed, we have a young ACLU attorney, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who, yes, the same Ruth Bader Ginsburg that's on the court today. Uh, we have a case out of Idaho in which the state of Idaho gave preference to men as executors of wills. We have a separated couple, the Reeds, who are battling to be the executor of their dead son's estate, but Idaho gives preference to Mr. Reed. Uh, that case was challenged uh, in the Supreme Court by Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the Supreme Court for the first time struck down a law discriminating against women. Uh, the early 1970s became the uh, era uh, of the woman uh, in Frontiero versus Richardson. Uh, the Supreme Court struck down uh, discrimination in the military. Sharon Frontiero sued, saying that her spouse, her husband, was not being given the same benefits that wives were being given uh, of male GIs. And once again, uh, the Burger Court stepped in and Sharon Frontiero won, and she should have won. Uh, the most famous case uh, of the early 1970s uh, was the landmark abortion case, uh, Roe versus Wade, uh, where the Supreme Court reaffirmed this notion to a right to privacy, and in this particular case, extended the right uh, to privacy to the right to a legal abortion. And of course, uh, that's probably the most controversial uh, of the decisions of the early 1970s by the Supreme Court. Uh, there have been uh, uh, all kinds of uh, mo modifications, especially in southern states, to try to chip away at Roe versus Wade. Uh, there is some discussion, for example, uh, that if the Supreme Court were perhaps to get one more real conservative member, uh, Roe versus Wade might be overturned. But at least for now, Roe versus Wade seems to be established precedent. Now in the next presentation, in the next mini lecture, uh, I'm gonna talk about the early women's movement versus the modern women's movement. And the early women's movement is really focused on two issues, uh, property rights uh, in getting the right to vote 
when we get to the modern women's movement, it is a much more complex, much more multi-layered movement, and we will talk about those next.